I'm going to um, call to order the uh, January 24th school committee meeting and actually the I'm calling to order the um, public hearing on the FY 2020 budget. Um, after the public hearing, what will happen is that we'll have the public hearing and then we will close the public hearing and um, have our regular meeting and I will go through the agenda items um, in case you guys are really wondering. We will be reviewing um, the budget questions that have been submitted by school committee members. Um, and then we have another agenda item. So in terms of opening the hearing, there is a sign-in sheet in the back and um, I need to just review uh, some of the procedures uh, that are relevant to the hearing. Um, first of all, anybody who comes to speak, we need you to come up to the podium and give your uh, name and address. And um, the, the reason we need you at the podium is so that that gets captured for the um, RCTV. Um, speakers will be allowed um, three minutes and uh, we would like to have everyone, give everyone an opportunity to speak um, you know, when they want to for that three minutes and then if people have additional comments, we'll go back and um, invite people, I will go back and invite people to speak again. Um, of course, we're gonna um, keep our comments. Um, the comments must be kept to the um, subject matter and as always in this committee, there's no comments um, or complaints about school personnel or members of the school community and definitely no dialogue about um, in, that would be indicative uh, of individual students. Um, all, all remarks are addressed to the chair. Um, uh, responses will be made by the superintendent or the chair um, or others at the chair's discretion. Um, we, the, the, typically there is not necessarily a response, um, but um, we'll, we'll do our best and I'll make that call. Um, and, I may, and the chair may request that um, a particular person answer a specific question. So that's, that, those are the guidelines actually around public input and a public hearing. And so um, with that in mind, is, is anyone from FinCom here yet? No. No, okay. Um, with that in oh, mind. Yeah. Who is? Guy right there. FinCom? No. No, okay. Um, Okay, so we will, and in the back of the room there was a sign-in sheet, there was also some copies of the agenda, and there's also copies of the questions that were submitted by school committee members. That's for the actual <coughs> meeting portion, not the public hearing. So if anyone has any comment for the public hearing, I would invite them up and state your name. Thank you, Ms. Wood. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Corum, I live on Ridge Road. Um, I'm very glad, uh, having been a budget parent for the past couple of years, I'm very glad to see a budget that Dr. Doherty can recommend, uh, that we're not seeing huge cuts. I'm especially glad that we could accommodate all the new teacher contracts in within the funding available, that uh, it's very important to get those contracts done, and I'm glad we did them, and I'm glad that they didn't break our budget. Uh, I am concerned about the special ed, and particularly the increases that we're seeing I appreciate the difficulties in projecting those costs six to 18 months into the future, and I, I hope that we're able to stay on top of those and that the increases that we see um, that are not under our control in particular are manageable as we go forward. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Quorum. Hi, Alicia Williams, Marla Lane. Um, couldn't print out what I wanted to say. My printer broke, so I had to read off my phone. Uh, dear members of the school committee, I stand here before you frustrated and sad by the fact that the 0.6 FTE for the music teacher at RISE is yet again not funded and was also completely forgotten about. By my calculation, the music teacher needs thirty eight dollars to $45,000 to be funded. To be safe, I rounded up to $50,000 to include health insurance. We need to find $50,000 in a $46 million budget a budget that has grown by $6 million in the last four years. We need $50,000 for a position that is instrumental in helping our most vulnerable population. Music helps children in so many ways. It's critical to the education of the whole child long term. In less than a 10 second Google, I found benefits of music for early childhood, a list that reads like this. It improves language development, improves focus and memory, improves fundamental math skills, 
improves discipline and teamwork, improves self-confidence and self-esteem. I also found music and movement together provide a lot, of many, a lot of benefits to the social, mental, and physical development in children. Moreover, incorporating music and movement in early childhood education helps young children with social interactions and growth. It's also been said that music therapy can help people with autism to improve skills in areas such as communication, social skills, sensory issues, behavior, cognition, perceptual motor skills, self-reliance, or self-determination. My oldest child struggled to speak until a teacher sang Twinkle Twinkle Little Star to him over and over. While she sang the two words, Twinkle Twinkle, my son watched her intently and finally returned with the words, Little Star. For the first time in 2.5 years, way beyond the milestone of 15 months for speaking, he said two words. My middle daughter benefited from the fabulous music program of RISE for one year. She would come home humming and singing every day after music, something that stopped in her second year at RISE, the year the music program was cut. Sadly, my youngest son has never had the benefit of a music program. A significant portion of the nonverbal children have great receptive language, but lack the ability to use expressive language. Music helps bridge that gap. I can't let a y another year go by and watch the children at RISE not reap the benefits of music. I stand here before you, not for my own children, but for the other parents that have no idea what they're missing. The connection between music and speech is too strong to ignore this need at RISE. Along with learning to speak, Singing helps develop facial muscles, and kids learn to use their tongue appropriately, which also helps in eating and swallowing, another, another difficulty of children with, at RISE. You may ask, how do we fund this? Well, I have some ideas, but in the, um, just because of the time limit, I'm not going to go through them. I can go through them later. Um, but there is ways in the budget to go through and find money. I found roughly $38,000 quickly. Just by cutting the, the athletics rose by 7.1%, if we drop it by 1%, we found $6,200. If you drop it by 1.5%, you have found $9,400. If you drop it by 2% more, it's $12,538. I don't understand the ins and outs completely of what line items entangle with salaries within these suggestions. I only hope that I can shake the tree enough to find roughly $50,000 to fund this position. This is our most vulnerable population, and everything we do builds the foundation for the rest of their life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else who would like to speak? Rebecca Lieberman, 50 Pratt Street. I would like to ask that we get a progress update on the status of curriculum maps for math especially, and start having Lieberman, monthly reports is, at school committee Mrs. meetings. Lieberman, I, I, this is, this I does just, relate to the budget. The subject matter is the FY20 budget. I understand. So we will open the meeting and, and have comments for items not on the agenda at the beginning of the actual school committee meeting. Okay. So could, we just need to focus on the FY20 yes, budget. Yes, in light of the, um, of the administrative salary increases proposed in the fiscal year 20 budget, I would like to ask that there be increased accountability for achieving goals such as curriculum maps. We've been waiting six and a half years now since the implementation of the new math program and yet another new math change significant has taken place this year. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments uh, for the public hearing? There's None seen. Nope. So if there's none, no additional comments, I just want to say that we appreciate um, the people who have spoken and um, brought matters to our attention. We will, I'm going to close the public hearing and then open the school committee meeting. So I'm going to officially close the public hearing. And do I have to gavel open the... I will now start the um, January 24th school committee meeting. Um, just a quick review. Just like to take a short deep breath and make sure we, we get focused here on our mission. Um, I'm not reading it, but we, and I will get this for my members. I keep it in front of me. Um, again, our goal is to uh, inst instill the joy of learning 
um, and, innovate and inspire the innovators of tomorrow. And there's a whole lot more to that, but that's the short, that's the, uh, short tagline. So I think it's important that we all come from busy days and uh, busy jobs, and we need to make sure that we, we take a deep breath and do the reset to focus on the mission of our public schools. Um, so tonight we have on the agenda our standard items. We have the um, FY 2020 budget questions, which are going to be re just um, reviewed. Dr. Doherty and Gailed out. Yeah, and we also are going to do the director of student services. So um, if there's any um, public comment uh, for items not on the agenda, I can take that now. Yep, Mrs. Lieberman. Thank you. I was hoping to request that the school committee initiate um, a progress update on where we are with curriculum maps for all grades and all, and all subjects, but most especially starting with math, since there have been so many changes, starting six and a half years ago with the new program that uh, delays algebra until ninth grade for most Reading students. And also starting this year, there's been another large change, that's the uh, elimination of the pre-calculus course at the high school. Uh, I believe that the content uh, some of the content may be folded into earlier classes, but since we have no um, curriculum guides available publicly, we don't really know whether there will be, sh uh, whether students will be shortchanged on content. And uh, I just feel like there needs to be some accountability here. Uh, back in the fall of 2017, the school committee actually requested an update on the status of curriculum maps for February 2018. That didn't happen, and the uh, math update that had been scheduled for March of 2018 also was canceled with, uh, and was not to my knowledge rescheduled. So um, uh, perhaps at your meetings monthly, you could implement a progress report on the curriculum maps as a specific agenda item to just see, you know, have two grades been completed, something like that. But um, the uh, middle and high school math needs to be a high priority, especially in light of the big change in the curriculum pathways um, that took place starting in 2012-13, and again, this uh, as recently as the current school year um, for next year's, next year's uh, students won't have pre-calculus as a full year course anymore. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Lieberman. <clears throat> Um, any other public input for items not on the agenda? Uh, then we have a, we'll go into our consent agenda and then reports. <coughs> so can you make the motion? Okay. Move to approve the consent agenda. Second. All those in favor? Great. And reports will start with Mara. So there's been a lot going on at the high school this week. We had the Martin Luther King celebration. Despite the bad weather conditions, many people came to the annual Martin Luther King Day celebration and breakfast held last Monday at the RMHS Auditorium. This event was hosted by the Human Relations Advisory Committee of Reading and had a variety of performances from local choirs and bands. It was great seeing the Reading community unite to honor Dr. King's legacy and lifelong work. This week, um, the freshmen, sophomores, and seniors have also been taking midterms exams. Although this means that this has been a stressful week for many students, the Reading Public Library has been especially helpful through its exam cram, a night where the library is open until 11 p.m. so that students can have a place to study and enjoy complimentary coffee, snacks, and engage in de-stressing activities. Dogs have also been brought to the high school in between exams to help manage student stress. While the freshmen, sophomores, and seniors have been taking midterms exams this week, juniors have been participating in real world problem solving. Real world problem solving is when juniors are placed in gr small groups headed by a teacher and given a relevant problem in our local community to solve. Tomorrow, their presentations and solutions will be judged to determine which group has the best solution to their problem. And then lastly, tomorrow, the RMHS mock trial team will face Penguin Hall at the Woburn District Courthouse. They'll be on the prosecution side and will hopefully take home another win. Thank you. <laughs> um, 
sorry, I just lost my place out, out of our order. Dr. Dar Dr. Darty and the staff. No. I have one um, that I just wanted to highlight. So um, the <coughs> as you, as you probably saw the governor uh, released his uh, recommended House One budget yesterday, and in that budget was. Um, uh, over a billion dollars for over a seven year period that was uh, increased for, for uh, Chapter 70 funding. When we saw the estimated cherry sheets last night, uh, town manager sent them to us, uh, Reading is not seeing any significant increase in Chapter 70 funding under the governor's proposal. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, it's about the same amount that we are normally seeing in past years, which is about a 1% increase. The good news is that this is the first year, because there's been a lot of discussion about the foundation budget yeah. uh, formula over the last couple of years. There was a commission that was put together in 2015, a series of recommendations were made, and there have been some pieces addressed in previous state budgets with the foundation uh, formula. But this year, for the first time, it seems like there is a concerted effort with House, Senate, and the governor to do something to change education funding. I was at uh, the MASS Midwinter event today, and the commissioner spoke and made it very clear that this is just the first step in the process, and that we need to make sure that if our community feels that we need more funding, and we've had lots of conversations over the last few meetings about special education in particular, that now is the time that we need to start making our voices heard. So um, I will be continuing to work with <coughs> MASS. MASS does have a very strong voice at the table with legislators. Um, I think a lot of suburban communities are impacted. Um, there are several communities that will benefit from the governor's proposal, but um, the House and the Senate versions also have pieces in it that could <coughs> help support Reading. So at the end, it's working, the, the three branches working together um, to come up with something that's going to impact all the community. So I will be keeping a very close eye on this and obviously working with our legislators in MASS uh, to see what else we can do to help support more uh, state aid for Reading. Um, I, I think to that point too, we We'll need to reach out to Dorothy Presser, our uh, MASC field director, and you know see how we can best leverage because the MASC also has a very strong um, legislative voice, and we need just to, just to make sure that we're providing our voice. And if they need additional information, we we need to be able to provide that. So I'll follow up with Dorothy. The the other piece I wanted to add, I just remembered, is that uh, another piece <coughs> of the budget today in the governor's proposal was. Uh, the circuit breaker funding right now is not fully funded. Mm -hmm. It's below 70% in the governor's budget. So um, that, that's another piece we're going to have to keep an eye on. Mr. Mm -hmm. yeah. Robinson. John, can you send us a copy of that? Did it come with a narrative or just the, the numbers, the cherry sheet? I can send it to you. I, we have it. Um, it's a spreadsheet, I believe. So. I think it's just, I don't think there's a lot of narrative right Yeah, there's not a lot. Of, it's a lot of numbers. It's about it. But we can, yeah, we can certainly send that. There are several webcasts coming up, so if they have any slides that go along with it, we'll forward those along as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Oh. I have the rest for FinCom here. Sorry. Sucks. When they get here, I'll let you get them out. Um. Uh, reports from committee members. Yes, Barowski. I have a quick one. Uh, a couple of weeks ago on January 8th, the CPAC met. Um, there was a nice attendance, and we had some discussion about the next CPAC meeting, which will be February 12th at 7 o'clock here at the RMHS library. Um, and I just wanted to acknowledge the group's effort to take something that they do every year, which is sort of uh, general information about special education in Reading, and try to do it in a sort of more innovative, more back and forth, more dynamic way. So they're taking what they have to do and what they've done in the past and really kind of brainstorming some different ways to approach it. And also, I believe, um, working in some time for parents to 
to network because as much as you need all the information as a parent about special education in the town, it's really helpful to meet other parents in the same school or in the same program um, to sort of interact. So um, it, it sounds like it's going to be a really great meeting on February 12th. Thank you. Great. Ms. Spress, any is there any update on the 375? Or? There is, and I'm doing that Monday night. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Robertson. I just I have a question for Dr. Doherty. I think I saw Joe out there somewhere. Is there any update on the Turf 2 project? Uh, what any more progress on that? So, Joe can correct me if I'm wrong. We started. We've had. Um, the firm out to do some of the surveys. We are scheduling a meeting in the upcoming weeks between ourselves, DPW, to get an update on where we are and overall timing. They were just out over right after Christmas to do start the surveying. Thank you. That's it. Any questions? Dr. Doxer? Um, do you want to yield to that one? Yeah, I'll do that one. Okay. Um, just a quick update on RACASA. There are two opportunities to celebrate Julianne DeAngelis, who is going to be retiring. And those are next Wednesday from 9 to 11 in the morning. That's January 30th at the Police Community Room and also at the Board of Directors meeting on Thursday from 5.30 <coughs> to 6.30. Um, many, many thanks to Julianne for all the good that she's brought to individuals and our community and her work with Reading Coalition Against Substance Abuse. Um, also, um, the news that Kevin Sexton, the chief, the chair of the Reading Board of Health, is going to be joining the RACASA board. Um, and if you're interested in um, applying for the full-time RACASA outreach coordinator position, um, that information is on the RACASA website, or you can see me and I can give you the website. <coughs> So please spread the word. We want someone wonderful. It'll be hard to match Julianne, but thank you. Mr. Bonin. Yes. <coughs> um, so I have one additional report. Uh, I just want to acknowledge and thank Dr. Darty for representing our district um, really to uh, the highest level of accolade today at the Masters Association of School Superintendents um, annual meeting, winter meeting. Um, Dr. Darty was asked, uh, as a result of the Dallas Award that he received, asked to be a keynote speaker, and um, I understand that he was, the, the talk that he gave was inspiring and um, was received a standing ovation. Um, and I think, I know that I had an opportunity to, to read it. Dr. Darty um, basically compared or and contrasted and walked through uh, con the superintendency <coughs> compared to a marathon. And I just want to share a few of the statements of his closing. I know he's going, why did I give that to her? Um, <laughs> but I, I think it's, it, Dr. Darty has been, let's see, in this role since 2010. And um, I think that this is just a nice opportunity. Um, it's about dedicating our lives to support students and create teachable moments that will last a lifetime and have impact on their lives. Our jobs are challenging, they're stressful, there may be long days, sometimes it seems almost impossible, just like running a marathon. But at the end of the day, it can be very rewarding because we are here to shape and mold the next generation. Those who sing, who perform, who compete, who study, and who may require additional support and assistance. We are here for students who are anxious, who need guidance, who have trauma in their lives. And when we can make a difference for students and see those changes firsthand, that is the high that you feel, just like when you cross the finish line at the end of a marathon. At the end of a marathon. As challenging as the last two years have been, the rewards have been priceless. As I reflect over my career, I am forever grateful that I have had the opportunity to be a superintendent. It is those student stories that make this job so great, regardless of the challenges that we face. On behalf of the million students that attend the public schools in Massachusetts, thank you for doing what you do each day in your school districts, because you make a difference. And I um, really appreciate that, and I'm sure that it was um, and it's an honor. And we appreciate that you represented Reading in, in such an amazing way, and that you're here with us. So. Thank you, Dr. Darling.
Okay, now on to our budget questions. <coughs> Eric, do you need to call to order? Um, there's three of them, four. <coughs> and uh, there's Inside. extra handouts up near Paula. <laughs> in the back. We will also be posting this on the district web page tomorrow. <coughs> we did want to let folks know we took a slightly different approach this year where we've grouped the questions by cost center and then within the cost centers we tried to group like questions so that people could see sort of the various themes that are going on. So we thought that that might, get, might make it slightly easier for folks not to be bouncing around as they're going through the document. So we basically just took everything we had and grouped it <coughs> by cost center. We will be sending this off to um, finance committee as well to help them go through their process so they can see the various questions that have been asked. One of the other items that did come up that we were asked to do is in the various presentations <coughs> we've made throughout this process, a lot of the charts and graphs that we've put have been at the most consolidated level where for each cost center we put professional salaries, supplies, other, but not all of the detail. We are going to go back to those slides and reference the page numbers within the budget book that has all of the details that make up each of those categories, <coughs> thinking that might make it easier for folks as they're either going back through the slides and looking through the documentation to have a reference where if they want more of the detail. When we're going to add that to the slide, so I thought that was a helpful piece of information, and then we'll incorporate that for when we do the presentations to finance committee, town meeting, as well as going forward. So we will be making slight adjustments to the slides. So the approach we're going to take this evening, rather than read and answer the 100 questions that we received, we're going, we've grouped them thematically, so we're going to go through some of the high level questions and themes and drill down into that. We thought that might be the best use of the committee's time since we did see two or three themes throughout all of the questions. So we'll have each sort of person go through and then if there are other questions we don't hit upon that people feel we should expand on, we'll be happy to answer questions. Okay, so everybody should have the availability of a paper copy of this right now. If you don't, there might be extras up front. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Ms. Vavin. First of all, just really quick, Gail, this, I really like this format for the superintendent. I like how this was, you, you collected like things together. Just, just for the public to know, this is the first time we've seen these as a committee. So we all submit them separately, and this is the unveiling. So if you see us flipping through them out of curiosity, it's the first chance that we have to see what our colleagues have asked. So, um, so this is new for us in real time as well. So there's no, we just separately submit our questions somewhat completely blindly. So there's no discussion. Um, of, of any quorum of the committee. So then that's the process every year, but just so people understand that we're, we're as curious as you are, but some of what's in here. The, so. um, the questions are submitted by individuals to the superintendent and to the chair. Right. So, um, and they were pretty exhaustive, and I know that the, you and the leadership team worked very hard on them, so we appreciate it. And uh, we did think that this organization <coughs> of the questions would really be very helpful to FinCom so that um, Eric and all his FinCom members would be able to be, be able to look more categorically and then you know say, okay, that question I had was answered. And hopefully we have less than 100 from FinCom. <laughs> okay. All right. Go right ahead. Sure. So I'm going to um, focus uh, first on the regular day piece and just talk about, as Gail said, the themes. First, I, I do want to say before I delve into my piece that um, Gail did an amazing job with these questions and I want to thank thank her publicly for all the work that she did. We received these on Friday, um, got a couple actually even today, so um, it's been an, a lot of time and effort have been put into the, the hundred plus questions that, <coughs> that you see in front of her, so thank you very much, Gail. Um, and, and the rest of the team that, that contributed to it. I, 
the first piece I want to go, I actually want to direct the committee to page 26, 27, and 28 in the budget book, because one of the themes that came up is around, um, in the detailed budget, two areas, um, supplies and materials and other expenses. And um, John, hold on one second. So 26, 27, 26, 27, and 28 eight in the budget, in the budget book. Yeah. So the detailed budget. So, and, and there was a theme of these questions. So that's why, that's why I'm referring it to the actual budget book. So you can, you can see it. So supply, the supply and material category, which you see under it has several subcategories, art, business, and then you see elementary curriculum, high school curriculum, middle school curriculum, all the way through. And then the other expenses, where you see dues and membership, equipment, field trip, travel, graduation. The majority of the line items under those two categories are the building-based budgets. So eight buildings worth of funding are in those line items. So every year, the building principals receive the per pupil allocation, which is actually on page 28, figure 17. And so I use Barrows as an example because Barrows is the is at the top, and I'm sure Beth won't mind me talking about Barrows. So Barrows, Barrows has for FY20 they're going to receive for their building-based budget $65,844. Beth worked with Gail. Um, and in the Munis budget, allocated funding out of that 65,844 to the different categories, primarily under supplies and materials and other expenses. All of the other seven principals did the same thing. So what you see in these line items, which the, the numbers, the percents fluctuate each year based on the needs of the buildings. So if Beth needs more art supplies in FY20, then she needed an FY19, you're going to see an increase for her building. But at Killam, Sarah Levesque may not need as many. So you're going to see, so that's why the percentages can fluctuate from year to year, and the amount for each of those line ends can <coughs> fluctuate from year to year. Because it really is based on the building budgets. The only areas where it's <coughs> more of a district-wide budget, under supplies and materials, is the curriculum areas, elementary, high school, middle school, um, under supplies and materials. So that's, that's where the curriculum, and there's some questions on that, which I'll get to in a second. And then other expenses, professional development and technology are the two areas that are more district-wide and not as much building-based. So I, I wanted to clarify that, because every year we get that question about the building-based budgets and where is this money allocated? It's allocated in those two sections in the detailed budget. Another question or a theme that came up was curriculum. So you'll notice on page 26 that there are three curriculum line items, um, elementary, high school, middle school. Over the last few years, the, the curriculum focus, the funding has been primarily allocated to science. You remember three years ago, we allocated a lot of funding to grades three through five, a little bit in middle school. The following year, it was primarily uh, middle school. And then this current year is K to two in high school. So next year, so science is, is now going to decrease because we're not going to be spending as much of the district-wide curriculum funding on science. And now we're going to be shifting gears towards social studies and some other areas that we may want to enhance based on some analysis that Chris and her team are doing in some of the framework areas. The big area that we need to immediately address for next year in social studies is, is middle school, particularly grade eight, with the civics curriculum. Mm -hmm. So we are currently taking a look at materials that are available. Right now we aren't seeing a lot of things that um, align well and I'm sure that they're playing catch up to the change in frameworks as the vendors as, as much as everyone else is. So um, you know we're we're 
Right, you mean so you're not seeing things available? Curriculum um, materials available for civics. Materials. Yeah. yeah. Right. Because the, it's, it's new to developing. it's new to the yeah. vendors as well. So, I just want to be sure. um, you know, this this is a process that's happening. These three areas also, it, and it's happened over time, is that there may be some shifting between levels based on the needs. Again, we're budgeting, you know, a year in advance for things, and some things may come up that we may need to address. So that's what the three curriculum areas, those are district-wide, and that's why you see the change this year. Uh, next year is focused more on, you see the increase in middle school mm -hmm. and the decrease in the other two levels. Thank you. Okay. So that was, that was a couple of themes that emerged from the regular day questions. Um, Yeah, those were the main ones. So I think now we're going to shift to special education. And Sharon. And me. Good evening. Um, there were, I think, 40, 45 questions around special education, the funding, sort of what we're looking at. And I called out some themes related to special ed as well. Um, the questions, I believe, start with number 40 on page 11 of the document um, in the Special Education Cost Center. There were a number of questions around enrollment, kind of who are our children, which programs are they being served by, which program model. Uh, so I did include in the questions a chart that broke out our in-district student enrollment between the different district-wide specialty programs, the bridge, compass, Connections, Crossroads, and our therapeutic support programs, as well as in our learning center programs. Um, and I did include a number of students in our preschool and post, because there were questions around that. Um, there was also questions around our enrollment in terms of how do we plan for what our students need, since there seem to be uh, changes that occur, which then have a ripple effect on who are, who are the staff that we need in the different schools, which children might need a program that isn't readily available here in Reading? How do we make those decisions? And I did want to respond to that question by letting folks know we do plan uh, at the student level as to what these children's needs look like at the point that we sit down in November and December and start talking about our, not start, but are, are well into our talking about the planning. Um, we work with the principals, we work with our special education team chair people who have a good idea of who those children are in the buildings. We pay particular attention to the children moving between buildings as they go up through the grades because that can have an impact on who the people are that will be working with the children. Um, and that why, as much time and effort that we put into this and we continue to have those conversations. They don't just end once we roll the budget out in January. We continue to talk with principals, with folks about the children. Um, things do change. It's the nature of who these children are and the nature of our business that we have to be responsive and flexible in what we put in place to support children as their needs change. Some of the variables are, are just out of our control. They, um, it isn't something we can put a percentage on or really plan accurately as we are really playing catch up a lot financially to then match the needs. But the enrollment is there on that slide for the in-district children because there were a number of questions about that. The next area that I uh, saw a theme was around our special ed staff which is again attached to who the children are, who the students are. Um, there were questions relative to is there any way to co directly connect our FTE of staff to the children, to the programs. And in, in some cases, we can have some not one-to-one -one correspondence, but some alignment. But in many cases, our staff work with children in multiple programs. Um, work with children who are in district as well as out of district. The example I gave for that was that our children who are in out of district programs also require ongoing monitoring. They need people paying attention to what's happening, observing, talking with the staff out at the program. Uh, that is all 
time intensive. Sometimes those needs are, are weekly monitoring, sometimes it's monthly, quarterly. It really varies student by student. Those children also are reevaluated at least once every three years, uh, which require our district staff in a variety of roles to work with those children and evaluate and test them, participate in meetings. Um, so it, it is difficult to directly connect every FTE to a specific program. Um, so there, those were some of the questions around our staff and how they get tracked and what their work is like. Um, there were a number of questions around the legal costs that we budget for out of the Student Services Office, Special Education Office. Um, some of the, the questions were around how did we arrive at the figure for the increase so that we, we did answer that. Um, we looked at, and by we I mean Gail, John, and I really looked at what has the expenditures been over time. Um, to what degree have we had to make adjustments mid-year to legal expenses in years past. We looked at the ongoing training that we know is provided by our legal counsel on an annual basis to be sure we accounted for that. We looked at some of the um, unresolved issues around student program and placement and made some projections around how many hours that might entail from legal counsel. Um, and came up with our figures. So it was sort of carefully reasoned. It wasn't um, just picking a number. So we did want to assure people that that was um, arrived at through really a thorough review. There was a question raised about have we planned for any potential outside agency review or investigations, whether it be through OCR um, or some other agency. And we didn't specifically plan for that legally. Uh, but we, we feel that through the analysis we did on student-centered <coughs> reviews, the number of hours we've projected that are needed, that it would be covered there if, in fact, we were required to um, investigate from a state agency perspective. Um, the OCR is uh, Office of Civil Rights, is a federal agency. There were some complaints filed a few years ago. Several of them have been settled and resolved. And, but there are still some open complaints on the OCR website, which I think um, a member of the community brought to our attention. And we've complied with everything they've asked us to, to date. Um, and so there's nothing further that they have communicated to us that we're required to do. The other thing I'd, I'd want to be sure the public understood is not every single uh, complaint or investigation that is asked of us requires legal counsel. Um, so that we didn't feel we needed to reserve a whole host of uh, more dollars, a lot more dollars than what we've already reserved for that purpose. The next area of questions that we had were around our cost increases and naturally there are a lot of concerns about that, about how um, large the portion of the budget is that the special education requires, what are the primary factors driving this, um, and it's, it's not any one factor. Um, I was asked in, in at least one, if not more, questions, is there anything unique about Reading and what we do in Reading that is contributing to this? Um, and in the, the short time I've been here, I, I would have to say, no, there's nothing glaring that I've come across that would say, wow, I can't believe they do it that way. That must be contributing to it. Um, so it's a problem that all districts face, um, and, and Reading isn't alone in that. The best we can do is keep communicating and monitoring what we're doing. The best defense around high costs occurring that are out of control is to ensure our programs are solid, well-reasoned, cover a continuum of needs. We're required to have a continuum of programs within our district. It's a regulatory obligation. Um, and that we continue to invest in our staff both on the general ed side and the special education side to ensure that there's collaboration and working with all children. Most of our children are educated in the general edu education classrooms most of the time, which research tells us will result in a better outcome for the students. Uh, so we need to continue to work on collaboration. It's very, very important. And that takes time and pre professional development as well as continuing to invest in our special education staff and their 
specialized teaching techniques. So they really need a lot of uh, P, not that they need a lot of PD, but we need to keep investing in them so that they continue to keep their skills strong and with the cutting edge of what's required. Um, there's also, in terms of what's affected us this year and next year, there are placement changes that occurred, which were, um, happened between, what I understand, between May and September. And that was well after the FY19 budget was secured and planned for. Uh, so we had to make some adjustments this year to respond to those student need changes that were basically due to intensity of needs, um, situations that occurred which were out of, out of anyone's control that resulted in a much higher need placement for a few children. Um, and some of these children in the out of district placements, when you move from a day program to a residential, for example, uh, it is a significant cost increase for ensuring the child is educated then throughout their entire week and including weekends, evenings, so staff intensive, so therefore there's a lot of dollars associated with that. Those, those are the main, those program changes and um, unexpected program changes that occurred with the main drivers. And those were the basic themes. Now, like I said, I think there were 40 some odd questions around special ed, but those were the, the highlights of the themes included in what the school committee was looking to explore further. Mr. Robinson. Excuse me. Uh, can we ask, yeah. I, I want to uh, ask actually back up to Dr. Doherty's mm -hmm. uh, presentation. Sure. Uh, on the civics, uh, and, and I'll preface it by saying I'm glad they're doing something, and, but I guess I, I heard something tonight that I wasn't aware of that there's, there's really nothing out there yet. So how do we come up with a, with a cost? I'd rather have you come to me like we did with the science and, and say this is what we gotta spend on science because we knew at that point what it was gonna cost. I, I, I guess, with the civics thing, we're almost just, I don't want to sound like a wise guy, just pulling a number out of the air for that, or I mean, if we don't know what's out there yet. Uh, so, um, Chuck, there are a few things out there. They haven't really been vetted. We have a committee that's put together. We're actually creating a rubric um, to look at different things that are out there. Yeah. There are a lot of online resources, which are great, but then they have the subscription fee. So we're going to be test driving a few of them to see what, what's out there. Uh, a team of us went up to Newburyport, which has had a civics um, unit in place for the last number of years just on their own. They kind of shifted mm -hmm. the middle school model and did civics in eighth grade already. Um, and we were one of about 10 districts that were invited to come <coughs> and listen to that. Um, there's a lot of state work that's being done. We have, um, our middle school team has been fantastic and they've been attending all of these state meetings and regional meetings. Mm -hmm. So we are really getting, we're sort of culling all the information. Now we had to come up with a dollar amount. I I'll be honest with you, it's probably gonna cost more than that. So we're going to do the best we can to get what we have. We know the state has given us two years to implement the social studies, and that includes all the implementation, um, pre-K to 12 in social studies. We have earmarked, because the most of the changes are 6, 7, and 8, <coughs> we are in a really good spot because our high school already uses an integrated model of history. So we're not going to have to do the major refocusing that a lot of districts are going to have to do at the high school level. There'll be some tweaks. There'll be some curriculum adjustments. but. The, the state is actually calling us to look at that. Um, and we're looking at from the lens of, okay, we already have an integrated model. What are the minor tweaks we have to do? Um, you're right, we don't know what the costs are gonna be. I can tell you that I am not one that we're just gonna write a check. So we're gonna test drive a lot of these things. We're gonna try, um, there are some texts out there. Some of them include <coughs> some of the topics, not all of them. Um, we're gonna try to get as much bang for our buck out of those things. But we are really guesstimating on that. We have met with a few vendors like Fall It and um, Sundance. Some of those companies are already starting to put together things. And we have sort of rough guesses. Um, Allison Stryker, our humanities director, has been really working alongside with me. Um, in fact, when we were at a conference about Title I reading, we actually met with social study vendors while we were down there 
we had them drive down the Cape and meet with us while we were there. So we're definitely on this. Um, and like I said, we already have a subcommittee of middle school uh, members from both schools really doing our first really kind of call to action is to come up with an instructional <coughs> rubric of like what are we looking at mm. so like what in in a perfect world what are our great resources um, and a lot of them are primary a lot of them are a combination um, we're seeing less and less full text mm -hmm. we may have like a set but not a million of them um, and we may be looking at online resources some primary documents um, there is a civics project that's involved in this as well. Um, so we have to also look at that. Like, is there going to be a cost to putting a civics project? The way Newburyport does it, it's more like a National History Day model with civics. Um, they've been doing it for eight years, so, you know, it's pretty dramatic. Um, we're trying to think of, like, does it make more sense for Reading to kind of tiptoe into that? Um, I'm actually interested in looking at real world problem solving tomorrow. I'm one of the judges Great. to look at like is a week long civics project something we could do year one and then kind of build from there. So we are definitely the budget is definitely fluid in that because we don't have exact costs. But we do know that we're going to focus on eighth grade costs first and then buy as much as we can in sixth and seventh. I feel confident that the number we projected will get us the eighth grade supplies. There will be some sixth and seventh grade items too because some of that <coughs> curriculum has changed. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Borowski. Just a quick follow up on that. I'm really excited about the civics incorporation yeah. into the social studies curriculum. So I think it would be really helpful as, as we go through that work if this committee got an update mm -hmm. on that. Particularly in terms of, yeah, what the curriculum is, what you've decided, how you've gone about making the decision. And also from a budgetary perspective, where did you meet the cost, where not, and where's that money going to come from? So sure. I think that would be helpful in the future. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Pavin. Request for 150k each into the district-wide science curriculum, and in retrospect, that was the cost of, I believe, purchasing all the things that the students interact with for the curriculum, but left us committed to a set of consumable aspects right. that was in play. Yep. And so, as we highlighted in the last meeting, we went from roughly 30k to triple that in science budget now, and that's okay if that's what the kids need. What I'd appreciate is just. A, a description of what those costs would look like, after, not just the implementation costs, right, but also the commitment we're going to be making to the supplier of whatever, so now the social study, not science, that's probably going to be mm -hmm. different, but try to give us the all-in number or, and when we would expect to pay, what's going to get just paid in? Yeah, there'll be, there'll be definitely less in social studies. Um, I can, the only thing I can predict would be costs associated to the project, as well as any online subscriptions. Um, to and primary you sources. Can negotiate any kind of discount. <laughs> I always ask for a 10% discount. Right? <laughs> right. Anytime I'm buying anything, so we're best words. I'll do my best. Thanks. You can, you can go higher than 10, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, we um, were there. Did, I know we were finishing Sharon's sort of overview of special the special ladies. education. Mm -hmm. Okay. But do you want to move on to what do we have district wide or what scale we've got? So in district-wide, the theme was around the renewal process. One of the questions we did have was asking us to look at five-year contracts. In accordance with Mass General Law, we actually are prohibited from entering into anything longer than a three-year contract unless we go to town meeting and obtain <coughs> approval. So we actually cannot enter into a five-year agreement we would need. Last year, we did go to town meeting specifically related to digital online curriculum and received approval for that. The technology world can get a little bit more difficult depending on what it is. So we would, it would be an interesting process because we would have to try to get all the information, get everything ready, get in front of town meeting either <coughs> April or November in order for that specific <coughs> renewal to look to do a five year. Um, so we're not really able to say what cost differentiation would be either because it's not something we can legally enter into. Ms. Robinson. Just because you were talking about that, uh, is there, and I guess, John, we'd have to talk to Bob at town manager, and f is there any way we can get 
some type of blanket approval from town meeting so that you have that available to you when you're negotiating and we don't we actually had a brief discussion this morning about that we would need to work with legal counsel to look at what the wording similar to what we did with the digital curriculum right. which yeah. you want to do it <coughs> broad enough but specific enough so that the concern always is if you do it too broadly it really opens yourself up to basically do any type of mm -hmm. agreement for five years so we did have a brief discussion with Bob this morning on that to look at what potentially we could do in which specific types of maintenance agreements make sense especially since both the school and the town side have significant capital projects that they work on that have the licensing and the maintenance agreements so we are starting that conversation thank you so it was very good timing we actually had a meeting this morning on that great keep going with there any other items in the category Um, the facilities, did, was there anything specific in the facilities? The or? facilities, the two areas on there, one is related to the cleaning contract. So we have put an estimate in there, as we did mention during the budget presentations, that contract is up for renewal. So we will be going through the competitive procurement process on that. What gets difficult is we're coming off of a three year this is based on preliminary discussions with what we might see. There have been a lot of changes related to minimum wage just went up, healthcare information, what different companies need to now provide to their employees, a lot of which will be passed directly on to the consumer. So we do not know definitively, but similar to what we've done with all of our other projects, we do commit to the committee that it will be a thorough process that we will go through by state bid list so we will be getting the best price but we do have to go through the procurement process the other area that we did increase um, is the substitute in overtime lines I will say the question was also very timely because I can tell you that the storm that happened over the uh. weekend we had people in all day Sunday and all day Monday at contractual overtime rates, double time, time and a half. So in order to ensure that the schools are opened and we were able to have the Martin Luther King Day, mm -hmm. we had every custodian in two days that is coming right out of that overtime budget. So our goal is always to make sure the schools are open, the schools are safe, and we do have to pull people in. And we have seen increases contractually in the rate so we do know next year that we will see an increase in that line item and it I can say that one of the things that we work very closely with the facilities department is we also do not fill shift for shift we examine each building each shift if somebody is not in we move people when we can and we do not do a one for one backfill so if we were filling one for one that number would be significantly higher so it is a very scrutinized I can tell you from watching them fill these shifts it it is building by building shift by shift that they're looking at but you get a storm like this past weekend we have no choice but to have people in for very long periods of time making sure the buildings can be open and also with a Monday when you've got freezing temperatures we also had people doing walkthroughs to make sure pipes weren't freezing pipes weren't bursting so Anybody have any specific questions? Okay. Mr. Bobbin. Yeah, so have we gone through the whole overview that Sunday was a question? Open season. Yes. <coughs> I want to I wanted to have a couple questions about special ed. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a little bit some observations and then questions related to the observation. <coughs> public comment earlier about pointing to the, the rate of growth of special ed we talked about uh, in last meeting about, in the, in the before that, I think it was last meeting, about a 7% rate of growth, about 7.4% over year over year, so we year, one year over 10%. So that's much higher than the rate of growth of the budget. Um, so given that this is a high growth area, as we talked about, 
I, I looked through, you say in the budget book that it's about a third of the budget, it's 32% of the budget uh, that's proposed for SY20 is in a specialized cost center. When I added up the FTEs or the full-time equivalents, I got a number of around the, about the same, about 30, 38%. So roughly a third of our time, a third of our budget. The other thing I, observation I made was that of the, um, of the money that we invest in the special ed cost center, it's about two to one in favor of the district programs. So that a third of it is going to out of district spend and two thirds is going to in district, mostly salaries. So any, am, am I forming the right impressions, I guess, and then I have some questions about this. Does that all sound correct? If that's what your financial analysis came up with, I'm, I'm not gonna no, question it sounds that. About, it sounds yeah. about right. Yeah. So if we look, and then when I looked at the, the out of district spend, which is the one third, right? About more than half of that is grades 11, 12, and, 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 uh, and later. It's, it's been talked about as well. So I, I guess the, the questions I have are, are twofold. One is around just benchmarking this to two things. One is ourselves and saying, you know, if we, if I, when I look back at prior years, it was a smaller fraction of our time and our money. Um, mid, mid 25%, 26, 27% has been gradually going up and there's a figure in the budget book that shows that. Um, out of district expenses have been growing very, very quickly too. And I guess I'm, I'm trying to understand, you, you did a good job last time kind of summarizing how you went through every single student need in, in a very systematic way when you put together this, this budget. Um, so give, given all of that, I guess, are there recommendations that you have looking to the future, not, not just where this is where we are, and, and anyone can draw a straight line and say, well, if it's 32%, is it gonna be a higher proportion in the future? We don't know what state circuit breaker will do or what, and we're asking um, certainly to be involved in a conversation politically about how districts are supported in special ed. I, I guess when I look at the higher, more than half of the students being older students, are there opportunities that you can foresee in the future based on your experience elsewhere. The question we should be asking the committee about, do we have the right resources here to plan for the future? Um, needs of students, are there ways that we could better address students either in this budget mm -hmm. or in the future? Um, just, just help us look not just at the present as, a, as kind of a, um, a snapshot of where we are, but I'm trying to get at the continuum of, this is a high growth area, we're investing more time, we're investing more resource. If that continues, what would we want to know today that we might wish we knew today, tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Okay, good, F fair question. And I know you, um, you or another committee member had asked specifically about those high school students and the number and um, what could we be doing about that in terms of program development or other interventions. So the, in order to really fully understand that, and I think it's time well spent and time I'm, I'm going to put some time aside to, to try and investigate that, is to ascertain what, were the, what was the educational experience of those students prior to high school? What were their, uh, what were the programming decisions that were made? What was their success? What was their progress like? And were there, aspects of their earlier education programs that contributed to either a slowing of the rate of progress, a dissatisfaction in the program, uh, impact upon the student outcome, or was there some type of a, um, change in the student profile that was profound and significant that then put those students' needs outside of the realm of what the in-district programs could effectively support. So those are all some of the variables that we need to look at. So while the uh, numbers of students in different places is certainly important information to track, you, you also have to go deeper in terms of what are all the variables attached to those students. Um, the other thing that I know about students and as they evolve through the grades and the ages is that during that period of adolescence, there are some biochemical changes that occur which for some children with some profiles <coughs> make it much more challenging for them to be able to um, keep up with the demands both academically, cognitively, socially, and emotionally that are placed on them in that typical adolescent experience. So that the differences become more 
pronounced and more difficult for those children to then overcome and, and get into school and, and still put forth good effort. So there are those, you know, neurology things that happen, biochemical, and then there's just what has that early experience been. So that, that would be some of my advice, and I plan to begin that work between now and June around what are those variables, and are there any common themes? Um, going back to what research tells us and other people uh, have determined is that the closer we can keep those children to the general education setting and curriculum, the better their outcomes. So we certainly want the children here <coughs> in our schools. Um, but there are some children, there's a reason we have programs out, out of district. There are some children for whom that is the right place. Um, so we do need to dig deeper into that. It's mm -hmm. not a strictly a head count or a dollar issue. Um, so those are, are, are questions that I plan to begin to examine whether I have all the answers um, you know, in the next 100 days. I'm not sure, but certainly want to look at that in terms of what's unique for Reading. Um, so that was, was one part of the, the question. Um, the other is in terms of the percentage, kind of where the money falls, how it all breaks out. Um, children, as they go through their educational experience, they encounter, we ask of them to think in different ways, to th synthesize information differently, and to interact with a greater number of people. So that in and of itself becomes a challenge for the children. So it's not all that um, atypical that you have kids as they go through the grades, the, the way their disability plays out becomes more impactful the older they get because we're asking more of them. So that they then may reach a point where they need something different. Um, so those are, are typically some of the variables that influence that higher number in the high school versus the lower grades. Um, and hopefully I'll get more information before uh, the next director is here, you know, working with the, the students and the staff and the parents. One follow-up, yep. Um, oh, you need to call to order. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ms. Boyd. Sharon, thanks for that. So the, the retrospective longitudinal analysis is sort of what I heard. I, I, lo I really like that idea. The other piece that I didn't hear you say for the out-of-district placements is just if there are opportunities, and I don't, I, I know we're in uh, two collaboratives, I believe. Um, yes. If there are opportunities, we, we talk a lot about transportation costs when we're doing these cost transfers to special ed the past year. Um, and so if there are opportunities to share some transportation costs, if that's allowed, either through the collaborative or other places, just look for ways yeah. to um, be as efficient as possible in meeting the out-of-district needs of the students in ways that don't impact their experience, like sharing a bus and that's permitted for them. Maybe yep. that's an opportunity. Maybe it's not. I don't know. But look yep. at those opportunities. So yep. we do, I mean, Gail, Gail may jump in, but we do um, secure most of our transportation through the Northeast network of um, vendors, and the primary vendor is the uh, North Reading Transportation Company. And it's run through the SEAM Collaborative, so that is who the primary transportation vendor is. There are certainly children who are on shared vehicles, whether it be in district or out of <coughs> district, um, but we always have to pay attention to the mix of the children as well as um, being sure they get to school on time. And there are variables, obviously, out of, out of everyone's control when you're on the road, especially if you're heading down Route 128 to some of the schools that are in that area. Um, but it's, you know, we, we do our best. We, we work very closely with the dispatchers at NRT uh, when problems are brought to our attention. Um, and sometimes it's the same problem multiple times, but we keep exploring it and investigating it so that we're balancing that efficiency against meeting our contractual obligation to get these children to school on time. And one of the items um, I do participate in sort of a round mm -hmm. table of all of the business managers in this area, and we did have a meeting a couple of weeks ago, and one of the takeaways I came back and talked mm -hmm. to Sharon is we're actually going to sit down with SEAM mm -hmm. and go through our invoices, go all th through all of our students and see if there is a way any of the routes, any of anything can be mm -hmm. consolidated. We work very closely with 
Wakefield, they, Wakefield owns or leases some of their own buses. We do cost comparisons to look at theme versus Wakefield. So we are constantly mm -hmm. doing that, but we have, we are in the process of setting up a meeting for February where we're going to go through and really look at all of the routes to see if there is anything we can do to shave that down. So it is something we do periodically to really sort of kick the tires, if you will. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Doxer. Um, a, a couple of things. One is thank you. A hundred questions in less than a week. It's amazing that you've given us these answers in such detail with such correlation um, so we can follow it. Thank you very much. Um, I, I was just very thrilled to hear about your, um, your interest in foring back to see where perhaps the, um, some of the special needs might be emanating from. Because I think there, if there's, there are so many things that are evident from the really effective presentations we've had. And some of those things include that there are hybrids of needs, that there are, that each child is individual. Um, there are also other sort of themes that have emerged from our society that mm -hmm. I think is really important for us to look really carefully at. I cannot tell you how many times I have heard the kindergarten is the new first or second grade, fourth grade is the new fifth or sixth grade that some of the special needs we're dealing with are anxiety and mm -hmm. school phobia and um, not getting a foundational knowledge to build on. Um, and coming from a developmental child study background, these really impact the way I think about what's happening for our kids. And so I love the idea that there will be a scrutiny of what's going on for our kids earlier on and not just starting with middle school about high school but before then. I know we have the multiple tiers of student support and that is um, bent on acknowledging the needs of kids before they become identified um, which I think is has been a really great um, tool I went to a presentation in Melrose by the previous education commissioner and what he said really disturbed me. He said that he felt that there wasn't going to be more money coming to special ed because he felt too many children were being diagnosed with special needs and so we needed to tighten up on our diagnosis and I took complete issue with him as did many people in the room because what we don't need is to tighten up on evaluations and getting kids what they need. What we need to understand better is for those needs <coughs> that are responses to our environment, responses to higher demands on our kids earlier, how can we recognize when that's happening and intervene with tiers of support or fighting back from the benchmarks that are offered to us from the state if that's appropriate or standardized testing that focuses us in on certain aspects of learning and takes out the joy of learning and the problem solving aspects. So I know I'm a little bit on my, my soapbox but I'm, I really hope that that is some of what happens because I do think that those things have budget implications for us in the long term like Mr. Boivin was talking about. Mm -hmm. And so I thank you mm -hmm. for And we always that have to be paying attention to research because what we know now, <laughs> regardless of whatever your chosen field is, is more than what you knew 10 years ago, I would assume. It's the same in education. So that's why we have to invest in our people and in the professional development and always stay on top of what's happening out there and not just be um, static in our approach. So, and you know, there's a lot of um, information out there around maker spaces and around, you know, bringing, when you talk about the joy of learning and bringing that kind of activity into our schools. It, our special education programs will only be as strong as our general ed. So we, 
always work in partnership. We, our special education goal is to ensure our children have access to our general ed curriculum. It's not to replace it, it's to <coughs> provide access and to provide the specialized instruction they need to improve skills and to be part of the greater school community. So we really are a support to general education um, access for our children and our families. So that's, um, we have to work hand in hand. That's why, you know, Chris and I talk quite a bit about um, educationally relevant topics, whether it's something that I find and come across that's important to special education or I might read something or come across something that I think might be of interest to Chris. We do that back and forth and we, and it has to happen that way and with the principals. So um, I appreciate what you, you know, what you've said about really where our focus needs to be. Thank you. Mrs. Perry. <coughs> Paula Perry, I'm on FinCom. Um, it's an interesting discussion, of course, gets everyone's discussion because these increases are so relatively high. I do remember years when they were also, you know, that high and higher. And I'm saying this not, no, I haven't really looked at the data to support this, but I wonder if this cycle would stay true you know, as we're going through, you know, service cuts year after year after year, we always articulate, we know that this could have an impact on the general education we're giving all our students, and the net result could be that the chickens come home to roost, and now you start paying for it in special ed. And I wonder if we looked at it in that way, whether we'd see that cycle, because I do remember that, you know, super high increase in spend, whether that related to the previous time leading up to our other override when we knew we were doing compound service cuts. And I feel like eventually you do pay for that, and I wonder if we're experiencing some of that, perhaps. Do you have anyone, any other comments from the community <coughs> questions? We, we need a question. Oh, Mr. Borden, sorry. Just a No. I'll just talk loud. Then. I got it. Okay. Um, so, thank you for the comment. And one of the things that I think about going forward is, is just being aware that we're addressing each budget each year, but it's also we're we're always part of a variety of trends. And and so you know I like the Sharon's uh, comments about doing a longitudinal looking at how students do over time and if we can find any connection between service cuts that were made at different mm -hmm. times in, in different cost centers, be it regular day or special ed, I think that would be, maybe they're just correlations, but you know, we don't want to miss an opportunity to learn from our past. Mm -hmm. um, looking to the future, one of the things that strikes me about this budget, and, and I need to read, you know, going as do all of us and read these, the, the comments and, and reflect on, on, on the proposed budget. One thing that strikes me right away is this is 584 FTE in this budget. This is, this is the largest number of full-time equivalents. I'm going to go out and limb here and say that, that I'm aware of. Is that? Probably. Yeah. No, you, no. You've yeah. You never had That's more accurate. hours put into a school district, and yet our enrollment is not at an all-time high right now. And it, it's, good. it's fluctuated. You know, I, I got it 1% to 2% around the median over the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it's moved up and down year to year. Um, but but it's not it, the, the enrollment has not gone up proportional to the increase in our FTE over the last same period of time, right? So we're committing more and more FTE. And, and, and the other thing that that I think of with that is that 90% I believe of our FTEs are are covered by our five collective bargaining agreements. So we have salary yep. co commitments to these personnel. Yep. Right? So that's baked into these FTE. The rate of growth is baked in and, and people may be on different positions in the salary tables, but we've, we've made a commitment. We'll keep that commitment, of course. So the, the, when I look to the future and I say, okay, well, we have a 3.6% overall rate of growth <coughs> this year, I think to myself, what, what could that rate of growth look like in the future, both in terms of individual cost centers and in terms of the, the whole? And that's something when we add FTE, like I went through the budget uh, table, I, I counted 49 different lines in the FTE table. Um, six of those go up. Um, of 
those six four are in a special ed cost center for reasons that are detailed in the report mm -hmm. one is a, is a retirement of a fraction of an fte going down uh, so w we seem to have a, a, a behavior as a committee where we tend to maintain our levels and you know student <laughs> needs maybe they're maybe that's appropriate i'm not saying that's wrong it's just it's just an observation that i need to think about but one thing that's going to weigh in my mind as I read through this budget before our next meeting and when we have to vote is, you know, are, are we asking the questions that are, are thoughtful and appropriate and forming the, the, the relationships with our colleagues on our other boards to talk about areas where, you know, how can we best serve the needs of our students, not just this year, but in the future? So if we're mm -hmm. going to continue to have rapid growth in cost centers. Just this notion of we keep putting FTEs, but we're not taking them out, and the student growth rate is not matching the FTE growth rate. So we're putting, keep, keep putting FTEs. So that's just something to think about. I, d I, don't, I don't have a value judgment on it. I just, it's just an observation. I, I can't help but think that more FTEs means higher rates of growth in the future. Ms. Sprowski. Um, it's a great point, and you're absolutely right. The only nuance I would encourage you to think about as you look at that and are contemplating the budget is the difference between growth and special education FTEs, which I see as completely mandatory and not up to our discretion. Mm -hmm. So if we have a 20% increase in FTEs and special ed that have all been determined by a team, that's a federal mandate. Right. And, and we all know the consequence of, of uh, the moral and ethical and educational conse consequence, but also the legal and the financial potential consequence. So I think when you're looking at growth in FTE total, it can hide where is that growth happening. Um, if you look at total student enrollment, you're right. That, that seems out of line. What I would be interested in, and, and I made a note based on your comment to look at, is is that growth happening in special education regular day both and to what, um, to what extent? So I encourage you to think about it that way. I, I think the other piece, there's a, another piece to your question is that, you know, um, with Ms. Perry highlighted, you know, where are we when we're in a down cycle and we're cutting? And we have the multi-tiered system of support, but where where we cut is, you know, where we, we put less resources or we take away those paras and we take, take resources away, that would be the tier one. And when we skip that tier one and that forensic or longitudinal study, you know, might show you, you know, that that, that could be an impact. To your point about we need to continue to have those conversations, um, certainly Dr. Doherty, um, Mrs. Dow, the town manager, myself, the vice chairs and chair of income are having those kinds of conversations because uh, this is not something, in, unless there's some predictor that we can see that's going to say that students are going to begin to need less services, um, you know, I, I don't know. The enrollment might not grow that much, although we have two big years of kindergarten, right? Um, so, and, uh, Somebody was talking about more housing in Reading over towards the uh, east side. So, um, you know, I think you know, we always have to be looking at that, right? That, that could shift, but I think what's operating here is what are the needs and how we, how we meet those needs. And from my perspective, um, I, I realize that we're federally mandated, but we're, we're also obligated for all children. That's our, that's our role as school committee. So um, figuring out how to achieve that balance going forward without getting into a situation of, you know, cutting from regular day, you know, not this year, hopefully not next year, but again, it's, we, we can see where we're headed. Can I just? Yep, Mr. I, Robinson. So Nick, I don't know what your four categories are of, of the new FTEs, but I, I, I'm guessing that at least three of those are some level of paraeducators. Uh, and, you know, I've been around for a lot of budgets where we, this is really the first year we haven't been <coughs> cutting, yeah. cutting. And yep. historically, the first place that the cuts came from have been in the paraeducator line. So I think we didn't add, we haven't added, added them all right back. I think they're just, we've been chipping away at that, which is where I think most of the new FTEs are coming from. Uh, at least in recent years. At FY20. Other than the few positions, the curriculum <laughs> coordinators and a couple teachers here and there, it's been mostly paraeducators, correct? The FTEs yeah. have been primarily pat. It's all been it, primarily special ed yeah. or enrollment. With this year, it's enrollment 1.2 of it. 
The rest of it has been special ed driven between paraeducators and teachers. And at the meeting the other evening, you heard two of the principals talk about how the needs are becoming more significant, which in some of the students requiring additional services and an increase in enrollment in those programs. Mr. Boyd. So, so two points. So Mr. Roberts, so it's figure 12 is what I was talking about. So the increases. Yeah. I was just looking at counting up the line item in figure 12 and comparing actual FY19 versus budgeted FY20. That's, that's what I was doing to get the numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that breakdown's on page five too, I think. Yeah, so, yeah. so that, that's where I'm getting my information from. Um, I, I did have a question for the superintendent. Um, we had, I think, a, a very good description of the for special ed, for district-wide, and for facilities about some of the questions that are asked in, in putting together a budget, like the FY20, to make sure that we're not um, just you know, accepting the funding or staffing levels of the previous year and just having them roll forward and presenting them here. For the regular day cost center, that's the one cost center I didn't hear a detailed description of the process you go through with your team to ensure that the recommendations here are reassessed each year for the needs of the students and not just, while well, we had five FTE last year, so let's just carry that forward because nothing's really changed. That, that's part of that process? same discussion. Okay, so so the it, discussion it the that was process? described last time, it, the biggest driver is enrollment, class size. So really it's a conversation that we have more at the elementary level, uh, which is why you see the net increase of 1.2 FTE. So I, we have the, what we hope is an accurate prediction prior to getting the registrations of kindergarten. We start those discussions in October, November timeframe. We now have pretty much, I would say, 95% of our registrations for kindergarten for next year. So we have a pretty good handle on that. So we know what we think the class, and you're gonna get a report on Monday on that and what our plan is moving forward for next year with kindergarten. Um, so really it's enrollment driven. Uh, which those are conversations that we're having during the individual budget meetings that we're having with each principal. Um, the same time we're having the special ed conversations. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Any other questions? All right, then we're gonna move on to, we have one more item this evening. I appreciate it. The item is, and actually I have an announcement. I'm a, sort of afraid I'm gonna forget it, so I'm just gonna, um, we, we will go over the calendar, but the March, we have a meeting in February on the 7th, uh, well, we sorry, we meet on the 28th to uh, Monday for our uh, budget vote. We have a meeting on February 7th, and the March 21st meeting is being moved to the 28th. So I just wanted to, to March 28th. To March 28th, yeah. March 21st is being moved one week later to March 28th. And, okay, and our, re our remaining item is, um, Dr. Darty's gonna go over the process and timeline uh, for our Director of Student Services search, which is not meant to undervalue any of the contributions you and all of the amazing work Sharon has done. You haven't no, no, convinced Sharon to stay yet? So, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I love it here, but. <laughs> um, so before I begin on that, I just want to piggyback on that last comment. So I obviously, as you can see by the information that you've been hearing in the presentations and the questions that Sharon has played a key role uh, working with Gail on, on the special education piece. And uh, we're very grateful uh, to, to all of that. Um, so thank you. And no, she isn't convinced that, <laughs> I haven't been able to convince her to stay. Um, Dr. Hardy, I just wanna, I just wanna thank, I know some of the principals are heading out and uh, the staff and I wanna thank them all for being here this evening for our public okay. hearing and our, our meeting. I really appreciate it. Um, I know you guys got lots of students to be ready for our first thing in the morning, so thank you very much. Okay, Dr. Darty. So we feel that this is the uh, right time frame to begin looking for a new director of student services uh, for uh, next year. Uh, we're hoping for a start date of July 1. Uh, part of the reason why we want to start now is that this is when uh, the, the pool of applicants would be at its highest. 
at least we, we hope, but as we have seen with other administrative searches, um, there's been a lot of variables that impact pools, so uh, we do feel, though, that this is a good uh, time to start looking for a new director. So what you see in front of you is a draft timeline. And um, Jen Bovey would have been here tonight to, to go over this process with you. She actually has a big exam tomorrow that she's studying for, so that's why she's not here tonight. Okay. Um, so like other administrative searches that we have put together, uh, there will be a screening committee. Uh, Jen will be facilitating it as the human resources administrator. We are going to have um, four administrators, a team chair, four teachers, four parents on the screening committee. Um, and the process, as you can see, we will be posting this position on Monday. Uh, we, uh, and we'll be using a variety of sources to do that. Um, we will be sending out parent feedback surveys uh, next week as well. Uh, for the types of qualities that they would like to see in, in the next director. And then we will also be soliciting um, parents to be on the screening committee. Mm -hmm. So we'll be sending out that information as well. As, and at the same time internally, we will be identifying administrators, teachers, team chair to be on, to be on this group. Um, this obviously is a central office position and um, a significant position as in, in terms of special education leadership, but also a member of the district leadership team. And um, so obviously we're gonna be looking for someone that has qualities that will be able to align with working with both parents, but also with administrators and, and, um, and putting together the, <coughs> the best special education program we, we can have in our, in our school district. So we, following the process, we'll have the organizational meeting, meeting to design the questions. This is all part of the process that we've used in the past with other um, administrative searches. We're looking at a deadline right now, February 20th. Um, and then we will, as we have in the past, we will be doing um, a pre-screening process, identifying a group of candidates for interviews by the screening committee, and that will be um, slated right now for the 27th. And these, these dates are subject to change based on a lot of factors. Obviously, we're in January and February timeframe right now, so winter could play a role in this. Um, once the screening committee identifies candidates to move forward, and um, that's when I will begin my vetting process of the finalists or pre-finalists at that point, we will be having one-on-one -on -one interviews, be doing reference checks before the um, finalists become public. Um, and then we will have the public process, which includes um, site visits, open microphone nights, interviews with um, DLT. Um, and then after all of that data collection, the hope is to have um, an announcement made for the school committee for March 21st. So that's 28th, sorry. Oh, sorry, 28th now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, Ms. Sprowski. Um, so I'm fine with this process, and it's worked well for us in the past. A couple of my colleagues alluded to this, but I do feel as the liaison to CPAC, I've had the opportunity to work with Ms. Stewart outside of this room on several occasions, and you really were the ideal <coughs> interim director of student services. Um, I've been so impressed and very, very grateful you were willing to come and help get us through this transition. So I just wanted to publicly thank you. And thank you. I know we all did, but thank wanted you. to say that. And to further request that you help us by facilitating a smooth transition. I think you have, with the years of experience that you bring to this role and the fresh eyes that you've brought to special education in Reading, I think you're uniquely situated to help a new director of student services. Here's what I've seen. Here's what I would do. Here's how to handle it. So I just really hope, and I'm sure you will. We've already knowing, had that knowing conversation. You, <laughs> knowing you, not a surprise, but I'm very grateful for your service. Thank you. Um, do we need a, are we a motion to approve the timeline? I move to approve the Director of Student Services search process and timeline. Seconded by Mr. Boyvin. All those in favor? Oh, oh. As, amended. As, amended. as amended with the date to March 28th. 
I yes. can ask a question about a motion? Yes. So can you speak to how the, the members, other than the allocation in 1A, how will the you know, particular parents, teachers, administrators be selected? So we always look for a cross-section. Um, well, with the parents, it would be we're going to be sending something out asking them to submit and the rationale why they feel they should be on the screening committee. So obviously we want to take a look at a cross-section of people, not necessarily from one level. Uh, we want to take pre-K to 12 um, or sometimes actually post as well. In this case, it would be post. Um, so we want to take a look to see do we have that diversity on for the parent piece. In terms of <coughs> the administrators, same thing. We want to have <coughs> elementary, middle, high school, preschool presence for administrators, uh, the team chair. Uh, certainly we want to have the team chair, one of the team chairs as part of this. Um, and, and then the teachers the same. We're looking for a cross section of both program teachers, learning center, uh, maybe general ed as well, because that's a key piece of this. So, yeah, so I, 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 I like the idea of, of trying as best we can to get a representative in each of the teachers and parents categories from elementary, middle, mm -hmm. yes. and high, at least one of them. And we've consistently done that with mm -hmm. our searches. We always try to get so cross section. And then some, would it, would it all be special ed, or would you also consider someone? No, some general ed too is. It, and the pa what about the parent group? Is that um, special ed? That would be part of the parents. Right. Is it general ed Are the parents mostly special ed? Who do you reach out to? Oh, no, it, would, it could be a mix. Out. Okay. It, again, it depends it on the... It goes out to the whole parent It community. goes out yeah. to everybody, yes. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Are you all set, Mr. Berger? And in Ms. Stewart's role, can she be one of the administrators? Ms. Stewart will be in a consultant role with us for this. Yeah. That yes. would be more appropriate than yeah. being directly on the I committee. I wasn't sure where she fit into this process. I've done searches for this position for school districts over the past couple of years, and so I have some insights about questions and vetting and great. what I've already shared with Dr. Doherty. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. All set. So we're ready for a vote with the motion as amended. And did we approve? It was friendly, so we're good. So all those in favor? And that's five zero. Excellent. Yep. So we, I think we went over the calendar. Uh, we need a motion to adjourn. Second. Seconded by. Uh, wait, I can't. I don't usually make it. Move to adjourn. Thank you. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Great. <coughs>